Welcome to Lecture 2, How We Study the Brain, Biological Psychology. Once again, this is Bruce Porter. In this section, we'll begin to look at how neuroscientists study the brain. What is it that they do? What kind of explanations do they look for? Neuroscientists begin at the molecular level, looking at their chemicals and the molecules, at the neural level, looking at the individual neurons within the brain, the synapses between the neurons. They look at the neural networks of how the, the neurons are connected, the genetics, the environment that we're all in, and the behavior that we show. Each level of explanation tells us something about brain function, but it does not necessar necessarily tell us about the different levels. Neuroscientists use the scientific method for seeking to understand the brain. In the scientific method, all ideas are provisional. It requires that, all, that the levels of explanation connect with one another. There are no conflicts. It's pretty much a three-part process of deciding on the brain region to test, to form a hypothesis, and consider the techno technological issues. There are common beliefs that don't hold up to scientific explanation. One is that alcohol kills neurons. This belief started many years ago from post-mortem exams that revealed the brains of alcoholics were smaller. More recent studies have found that the brains got smaller because of the neurons got smaller, not fewer. And another common belief is the Mozart effect, that classical music makes babies smarter. That playing classical, and this belief began with a, a study on college students. And the study found that playing classical music to college students made them perform better in one type of intelligence test, but this effect only lasted for about 20 minutes. The original results of this test were not reproduced, uh, were not reproducible, and since uh, have been refuted. However, learning to play music helps children with spatial reasoning tasks. Describing the structure of a brain is a straightforward endeavor. Understanding how the brain works is much more difficult. The main categories of methods for studying the brain function are correlate brain activity with behavior, uh, brain anatomy with behavior, excuse me, uh, record brain activity during behavior, examine the effects of brain damage, or examine the effects of stimulating some area of the brain. Correlating brain activity with behavior began as a study called phrenology. It is a process based, uh, developed by Franz Joseph Gall back in the 1800s, where he tried to relate skull anatomy, the bumps and the dips, uh, bumps and dips and texture of the skull to different behavior capacities. Today researchers try to relate size of a particular area within the brain with some specific behavior. Several methods now exist to examine brain anatomy in detail in living people, including the CAT scan, an x-ray technique that can reconstruct images of the brain on a computer. There's the MRI. A MRI device applies a powerful magnetic field to align all of the axes of rotation in the cells and then tilts them with a brief radio frequency. When the radio frequency is turned off, the atomic nuclei release this electromagnetic magnetic energy as they relax and return to their original axis. The MRI device measures the released energy and forms an image of the brain. In recording brain activity, in laboratory animals, researchers can record brain activity with electrodes. In humans, brain activity is recorded using non-invasive methods, such as the EEG, a device that records electrical activity of the brain through electrodes attached to the scalp. EEGs can record spontaneous brain activity or activity in response to a stimulus. There's the MEG, 
a device that measures faint magnetic fields generated by brain activity. This device, unlike the EEG, has excellent temporal resolution. The PET scan, the PET scan, a device where an uh, investigator injects a radioactive chemical and detectors around the head map the areas of the brain with the highest levels of radioactivity. PET scans can be used to measure brain activity or the binding of a drug to different brain areas. There's the FRMI, a technique that measures changes in the blood's hemoglobin molecules as they release oxygen, mainly in the brain's most active areas. Because the FRMI is safer and cheaper than the PET scan, it has replaced the PET scan for many purposes. One of the most difficult tasks in using these non-invasive met methods is the interpretation of what the images mean. Critical to, to, to making an appropriate interpretation is a choosing an appropriate comparison tasks. Then there's the study of brain damage. The French neurologist Paul Broca pioneered the modern neurology when he discovered that damage to a particular region in the left frontal hemisphere is associated with a loss of ability to speak. This area of the brain is now known as the Broca's area. Since Broca discovered many other, uh, dis since Broca's discovery, many other researchers have reported behavioral impairments after brain damage. The strategy researchers use to describe br the brain damage and then examine the brain damage under a microscope after the person dies or through brain scans while the person lives. This type of research is problematic because of a lack of control, as no two people will have the, exactly the same type of brain damage. In laboratory animals, researchers can intentionally damage a selected area. There's a lesion, which is just a damage to an area, and there's an ablation, which is the removal of an area. In lesion studies, researchers must compare animals with, with lesions to animals with what's called sham lesions to control for procedures, except for the actual lesion. Researchers can also use a gene knockout approach where they direct a mutation to a particular gene that is important for certain types of cells, transmitters, or receptors. The transcra transcranial magnetic stimulation is the application of an intense magnetic field to a portion of the scalp. It can be used to temporarily interrupt brain activity. After causing uh, damage to an animal's brain, the main problem is to specify exactly how the behavior has changed after the damage. Brain stimulation should increase some behaviors just as brain damage impairs it. In laboratory animals, brain stimulation can be produced by applying brief electrical stimulation to implanted electrodes. In humans, brain stimulation is accomplished by magnetic fields applied to the scalp. The magnetic field used to stimulate brain activity are briefer and less intense than those used to interrupt brain activity. Brain stimulation is very useful for understanding behaviors that are solely mediated by a single brain area, such as seeing a flash of light. However, this approach is not as informative for complex behaviors as they typically involve coordinated contributions of many brain areas. Overall brain organization is maintained across species, but the size of the brain varies both across and with, within species. Researchers have tried to determine whether these size differences are related to intelligence. All mammalian brains have the same b basic uh, organization and resemble one another in the portion of the variations of the brain. In the term of brain size, elephants brains are four times the size of ours and sperm whales brains are twice as big as elephants. Brain to body ratio may provide a better measure of the role of brain size to intelligence as uh, species regarded as intelligence such as humans have larger brain proportions to body size 
than do species we consider less intelligent, such as frogs. However, the brain-to-body ratio also has problems. Chihuahuas have the highest brain-to-body ratio of all the dog breeds, and squirrel monkeys have a higher brain-to-body ratio than humans. In fact, a common tropical aquarium fish has a higher brain-to-body ratio than humans. Older studies found that very low correlation between uh, older studies have found that very low correlation between brain size and intelligence. This lack of relationship was most likely due to problems with measurements of both intelligence and brain size. Current studies <coughs> using the MRI scans have found moderate positive correlations between brain size and IQ. Further studies have found that general intelligence is correlated with gray matter thickness throughout the cortex. In our brains, we have both gray and white matter. The gray matter is our dendrites, and the white matter is our axons. Genetics probably influences brain size and intelligence. Studies have demonstrated that greater similarities between identical twins than fraternal twins for both brain size and IQ.